After church, the farmer invited the preacher to his home for a big chicken dinner. The preacher, he ate and he ate and he ate and he ate. After dinner, the preacher and the farmer were sitting on the front porch when a big rooster came strutting past. The preacher looked at the farmer and said, boy, that's a mighty proud looking rooster you got there. The farmer replied, he has a lot of reason to be proud. Two of his sons entered into the ministry today. <laughs> pride is considered one of the seven deadly sins. In fact, pride is the deadliest of the seven deadly sins. One reason it is the deadliest is because pride is something we don't often recognize in ourselves, but we do see it in others. I remember when Pastor Randy Frazee, we were watching the video series here at Summit Church when he shared his own personal story that when he was going through a period of self-assessment and evaluation, he asked people close to him to evaluate him and give him an assessment. And three or four of them, including his wife, told him that he was proud. And he talked about how angry he was for a long time about that until finally God touched him in his heart and basically told him that what they were telling him was true. It's very hard for us to see pride in ourselves, even though we do see it in other people. Most people seem to know the quote that pride goeth before a fall. However, to be honest with you, that's actually a misquote of Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 16, 18 actually says pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, having said that, there is absolutely nothing wrong with saying pride goeth before a fall. Because Proverbs 16, 18 is what we call Hebrew parallelism. Hebrew parallelism is when something is stated and then restated just simply using different words, but has the same identical meaning. So when it says pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall, we could sum that up very simply and say simply pride goeth before a fall. That is the meaning of the passage. The reason pride is the deadliest sin, according to Christianity today, is because pride is delusional, spiteful, and bitter. At its root, it declares, I don't want God to be God. I want to be God. Sinful pride is refusing to recognize God's sovereign role in everything. In other words, anything that dethrones God from your heart is deadly. Anything that makes us sit on the throne of our own hearts is definitely an issue. Now, as we've been talking about for a number of weeks, all the kings of the northern kingdom called Israel were considered bad kings. Of every single one of those kings, the Bible says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Every single one of the kings of the northern kingdom rejected the Lord from their lives. And the northern kingdom, as we know, was characterized by godlessness, chaos, assassination, and political turmoil. The south was very different. Of the first 16 kings of the south, eight of them were good and eight of them were bad. Overall, the south was very stable politically. A descendant of David was always on the throne with the exception of Queen Athaliah when she seized power after the death of her husband. Phil Hinkle came up to me after my sermon a couple of weeks ago on Athaliah and he asked me a question that I thought was interesting because I had said that Athaliah wiped out all of the descendants of David except for one. And he reminded me that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And he said, Solomon must have had a lot of children. But then I reminded Phil that, you know, if you start thinking about it, number one, you know, if you have a thousand wives and you spend one day with each wife uh, that you can spend, you will basically spend one day in three years with that particular wife. But we know that many of these wives were really political arrangements and had no real relationship with Solomon. And plus, Solomon, as the king, would have known that any child he had could be an heir to the throne. So I'm sure he was very careful about having children. And 
plus, on top of all that, the Jews kept very, very meticulous records of all the births of the children that came from the kings so that they would always know what the succession would be to be the next king. And when Athaliah rose to power, she had that list in front of her and she was able to go out and to wipe out every single descendant of David who was on that list, every rival to the throne with the exception of the one who was hidden away in the temple of God. The last good king of Judah was Josiah. The Bible says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he followed completely the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. The prophetess Huldah is going to shed some additional light on why Josiah was such a good king. She says, because your heart, Josiah, was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord, you will not see the fall of Jerusalem. The next four kings did not follow in the ways of the Lord. And Judah would ultimately completely collapse to the armies of Babylon. But they really didn't capitulate to an outside army as much as they collapsed from the inside out, which is often the story of many nations that have been conquered. It's interesting that Josiah actually became the king at the age of eight. His father was assassinated. And there was a coup trying to put a new king on the throne, and that coup failed. And those who overthrew the government or thought they were in the process of overthrowing the government were actually put to death. And his son, Josiah, then became the king at the age of eight. Josiah was a godly king who followed in the ways of his great-grandfather, Hezekiah. He began to put money into the temple of God that had fallen into disrepair under the previous administrations who did not have his godly heart and his godly attitude. As they were restoring the temple, they find a copy of the book of Deuteronomy. It was the book of Deuteronomy that was read to Josiah that caused him to tear his clothes, which was a sign of mourning and repentance. And then he called for a time of national repentance. I can tell you, the last time I read the book of Deuteronomy, my response was not to go into a time of mourning and national repentance. It's a difficult book in some ways to read. But yet when we think about the impact it had on these people, we understand how starved they were to hear the word of God. How hungry they were for a relationship with the Lord. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Josiah did just that. He humbled himself before the Lord. He was not lifted up with pride. Pride is indeed the deadliest of the seven sins, but it's also the hardest sin to understand and often the hardest sin to recognize. There are a few places in the Bible where pride is actually considered to be a good thing. We find pride in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, where it talks about King Jehoshaphat, one of my favorite kings to say his name, and his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. The word delight could be translated as pride. His heart was lifted up. Because the normal word for pride in the Bible means to exalt. It means to lift up. And it has the idea oftentimes of being lifted up and feeling that we are above others. James chapter 4 verse 10 though says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. A good pride begins with an understanding that all that we are and all that we have comes from God. And I'll say that again. A good pride begins with an understanding that all that we are and all that we have comes from God. A bad pride begins with an understanding that all that we are and all that we have comes from us. Just this morning, I was reading a couple of news articles, and I I noticed that Harvard University has just elected a new head of chaplains. They have like 40 chaplains on campus, and they represent a number of different religious traditions, and they just elected the head chaplain, and it really shocked me to see that the head chaplain is an atheist. And the head chaplain made the statement. He said, we don't go to God for the answers. We go to one another to get the answers we need about life. 
And in the comments under that article, there was somebody who brilliantly wrote, and I thought it was a great comment, said, I think Harvard needs to get rid of all of their professors and let the students get the answers from one another. I thought that was a good way to think about it. Josiah didn't continue to humble himself in the eyes of the Lord throughout his entire reign. In fact, Josiah's end is going to be tragic because he's not going to seek the Lord's direction at the end of his reign. And he's going to go into battle against Egypt and he is going to be killed. As the Bible says, pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. But for the most part, Josiah was such a good and godly king who did depend upon the Lord. But anytime we get away from our dependence upon God and we begin to depend upon ourselves, we begin to fail. I've read recently that the United States spent $2 trillion on their occupation of Afghanistan. We occupied Afghanistan for 20 years. Yet in the end, we know that it has ended in, in a total debacle and the Taliban are now taking over control of that country. And the question we ask ourselves is what went wrong? One thing that clearly went wrong is we had pride as a nation. We thought that because we were the most powerful nation on the earth, we thought because we spend more on our military than any other nation in the world, we thought because we have all this power and all this influence, we could take over this nation and we could transform them into what we wanted them to be. There's an old saying, those who do not know history, repeat it. My statement would be those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. We thought that we could do what the Russians couldn't do in 10 years that they occupied Afghanistan. We thought we could do what the British failed to do. Empire after empire tried to conquer this land and empire after empire basically failed. Probably the most successful empire that conquered this land was Genghis Khan and the way he conquered it was by slaughtering millions of their citizens. We thought that we could take over this land and we could transform them into what we wanted them to be. And we failed. Military might and money are not the real answers to the problems of life. We've experienced so many problems during this time of COVID. We've had racial divide, injustice, defund the police, violence, protests, turning violent, looting, attacks on Asians. And now we are seeing on the news, I've seen it a number of times, the anti-vaccination and the anti-mask protesters out there in the streets fighting against those who are pro-vaccination and pro-mask. And there is conflict and even sometimes major injuries in these protests. The tone is not one of understanding or agreeing to disagree. The tone is, I hate you because you have a different opinion. I wrote something on a couple of different social media platforms. I wrote my own experience with COVID just to share what was going on in our community and in our congregation, just so people would realize just this one simple fact that COVID is very real. Whatever we think of COVID, how we deal with it, we all have different opinions, but we do all need to understand that COVID is a real illness. One of the people who responded to me basically said that COVID is not real and that people who are dying are dying of something else. And I politely replied, but some of the replies weren't so polite. In fact, one person responded and said, I hope you die a horrible suffering death from COVID-19. We see a lot of that in our country right now. We see a lot of people who think they have all the answers because they're full of pride and they think they know everything they need to know and everybody else is totally wrong. So how do we deal with problems in America? So often we throw money at the problem. We throw more money into education, trying to convince people that they're not right. We throw money into racial inequity. We throw money into training the police. We throw money into social programs. And you can fill in the blank of all the things we throw money into. Now there are some things we throw money into that are very good. When we build hospitals, when we build schools, that's obviously a great thing to do. When we build a well in a foreign country for a village that doesn't have clean water, that's a wonderful thing to do. We can throw our money into things that really work, but too often we throw our money into things that really do not work. 
The real problem is that we are addressing the problem from the standpoint that we have the knowledge and the money to fix it. If we throw enough money at the problem, we can fix that problem, and this is the very essence of pride. We can fix the problem ourselves. We don't need God. The answer comes back to the human heart. Polly said it so well to me this past week in the hospital when we were visiting Travis. There is just so much hatred in the world right now. And my biggest frustration right now is that much of it is coming from inside the church. I listened to a podcast this week. It was a pastor who was asked to deal with the COVID crisis in California. And he did this 26 minute podcast and a friend of mine from another state sent it to me and said, you need to listen to this. Pretty good. I listened to it and, and some of it was very good. He tried to be fair and he tried to be objective, I thought, and he tried to, to, to deal with the COVID crisis. And he specifically mentioned we need to put aside our pride and come to this issue with humility. But the thing that bothered me about the article was that under the surface, I could see his own pride coming out as he talked about the COVID crisis. In fact, he had to spend a number of minutes of 26 minutes talking about how he had had some classes in anatomy and physiology. So he knew what he was talking about. And he said he read a lot of articles, so he was well informed. And I thought to myself, you know, pride comes out even when we don't know it's coming out in our lives. And I thought pride was coming out. And I thought he could have done so much of a better job with that podcast. When I was in college, we used to say the most dangerous person in the world is the freshman taking psychology. The freshman taking psychology learns a few terms in class and then they go out and they start psychoanalyzing everybody, their roommates, their friends, their family. They, you know, you start sharing a personal story with them and, and they look at you and go, I think you have anxiety disorder. I think you might be, you know, manic depressive. I think, I think you, have you ever been tested for being bipolar? You know, they start diagnosing you, but they have such limited knowledge, but they don't know what they don't know. Their pride makes them think that all of a sudden they have all this knowledge and they can use it and they really can't, really cannot use it. Now, I used to think the most dangerous person in the world was the freshman taking psychology. But I've changed my mind. I now believe the most dangerous person in the world is the pastor who thinks they know more than they actually do. You see, we as pastors are not medical experts, at least most of us aren't. There are a few that are, but most of us aren't, and I'm certainly not a medical expert. But what I do understand from my biblical training and my biblical understanding is how do we address the issues of the human heart? How do we put God back in our lives instead of throwing God out and saying we're going to do it all by ourselves? James chapter 4 starts out with an interesting beginning. James asks the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires, the heart, that battle within you? You desire from the heart, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet comes from the heart, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. God isn't first in your life. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. What James is doing in this passage is he is connected, connecting the absence of God with what's in our hearts. And then he gives us the answer. And to be honest with you, I have preached on this passage. I've read this passage a number of times in the past. And I never quite saw it from the same perspective that I saw it this week when I was working on this sermon. The answer is, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and weep. Turn your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, take an honest look at yourself. Look at where you fall short of the glory of God. Look at your own inadequacies. And then in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. There's the answer right there. Is we come to the Lord in humility and we submit ourselves to him and it is he who will lift us up. As many of you know, I already talked about it. My good friend Travis passed away this past week. We celebrated his life on Friday morning. 
And it's been a very difficult week for all of us, but I want to continue to celebrate Travis's life. One of the stories I told at the service on Friday was about putting the cubbies in over at his kids' Christian school. Travis was one of the main people involved in that. In fact, we were trying to do it on our own. We weren't doing very well. And then Travis came in, he took over, and all those cubbies started going in the way they were supposed to go in. They were so neat and, and they were well anchored and everything was being done the very right way because Travis had that expertise to know how to do that. And they were looking great. We moved all the way through the lower part of the school. We went up to the upper classrooms. And when we got to the upper classrooms is where we ran into our problems. Because where the cubbies needed to go, there was already a space there that was hollowed out, a closet kind of a space. And we had to figure out how to get these cubbies to go in there and fit appropriately. And it was a lot of finagling, a lot of work, a lot of cutting off and trying to measure and figure out how to get these cubbies to fit in there and make them look good. And when we were done, Travis stood there and he looked at it and he said, I don't like it. It doesn't look good. And I said, well, Travis, it's good enough. And Travis, no, no, it doesn't look good. He said, I've got to fix this. And we took a break for a while. And, and somebody after the funeral on Friday reminded me of a part of the story I'd totally forgotten about myself. And that part of the story is that Travis called a friend of his who had more expertise in building and doing things like this than he had and had that friend come over to the school and look at that project to tell Travis how to do it. And as I thought about that after the funeral on Friday, I just couldn't help but think, you know, for Travis to do that, that's humility. Because he recognized that as good as he was, he still wasn't good enough to get it the way it needed to be done. The way that he would be happy with it. The way that it would look really, really good. And so he brought in this friend to get another opinion. And this friend told him how to do it. And Travis said, I can do that. And Travis did the job. That's what humility is. It's when we say to ourselves, I can't do this. I can't do this on my own. I can't get through another week like we had this past week on my own. I can't deal with these trials and tribulations that are coming into my life on my own. I can't be a pastor to this many people on my own. I can't be a king or a ruler to the people on my own. I need help, and that help needs to come from above. It's only when we make that admission that we can then say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen and amen. And now please remain seated and join together in our hymn of response, Christ Alone.
I personally believe we lost Afghanistan because we didn't win the hearts of the people. And that's where real change starts in the heart. And one thing I love so much about Travis was he had such a big, big heart. He loved his wife, he loved his boys, and he always wanted the best for his family. And he always wanted his boys to be the best that they could be. And that was a wonderful challenge to me and a wonderful challenge for us to seek to be the best that we can be. And the starting point is to humble ourselves before the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, this morning we give you our hearts. We pray that we will bow before your throne of grace and humility, knowing that you are the one who made us, you are the one who gifted us, and you are the one who calls us to go into the world. And you are the one who gives us the strength, the power, the love, and the mercy to live each day for your glory and honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.